Richard Blagrove, this is a real treat for the Masters Athlete Online Symposium. Uh, I am a big fan of your work. Uh, your book sits on my bookshelf at Pogo Physiotherapy. So welcome to the Masters Athlete Online Symposium. Thanks very much for the invitation, Brad. And uh, Richard, by way of bio, uh, hailing there from Loughborough University, lecturer in physiology and program director for the Masters in Strength and Conditioning. And really looking forward to this, what I know will be a really insightful session around strength and conditioning considerations for the Masters runner. So take it away there, Rich. Thanks very much. Yeah, I just want to start by extending my thanks to yourself, Brad and Benoit, for the invitation to speak at this, uh, this symposium where I'm going to be discussing uh, strength and conditioning considerations for the Master Runner. Um, as, as Brad mentioned, I'm currently a lecturer and programme director at Loughborough University, but I've also got a background in, in practising as a strength and conditioning coach and really specialised in work with middle and long distance runners over the last 10 years or so. And the majority of my research at the moment um, focuses on the effects of strength training on performance and health of distance runners. So the aims for the session are really threefold over the next 20 minutes or so. I'm firstly going to explain how strength and conditioning might potentially enhance the performance of middle and long distance masters runners. Secondly, I'll describe age related uh, reductions in physical and performance characteristics that might impact distance running performance and increase risk of injury. And thirdly, I'll finish off with providing some practical um, recommendations around appropriate strength and conditioning activities and prescription of those activities designed to try and improve performance and lower injury risk in masters runners. So by way of introduction, I think this may be something you'll hear across a number of talks in this symposium that we're seeing an increased level of participation in older masters age groups. And this is particularly important because certainly in Western countries, we've got an aging population and we know that levels of uh, increases, levels of physical activity associated with improvements in functional capacity in, in older years and a reduced risk of things like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, uh, certain types of cancers and os osteoarthritis. Um, but also importantly for athletic performance, we see that these increased levels of participation are also raising the standards relative to improvements in younger age groups and past performance, um, past performances in, in master's age groups. However, it's important to be aware that from age kind of 35 onwards, so 35 defines when our master's age group starts, that we see age-related declines in physical performance and characteristics, which are largely attributed to decreases in cardiovascular function, neuromuscular factors, which are obviously important for, for strength training, um, and bone and joint health. So continued engagement with regular exercise and physical activity, such as running, can obviously slow this decline. So looking at uh, determinants of distance running performance, we know that dis distance running performance is largely limited by our physiology. And this is summarized quite nicely in this kind of classical model um, of distance running performance that was put forward by Mike Joyner in the early 1990s. So on the left hand side here, we've got VO2 max, which is the maximal amount of oxygen that we can take in from the atmosphere, transport to the working muscles, and then use effectively to, to resynthesize energy uh, to fuel our performance. On the right hand side, we've got running economy, which is defined as the oxygen or more specifically the energy cost of running at a given submaximal intensity. And then in the middle there, we've got fractional utilization, which is the proportion or the percentage of VO2 max that can be accessed for a given distance or duration. And these three factors combine together to predict the speed at which we uh, can perform at a given threshold, and in this particular model, it's for marathon running performance. And this then dictates the speed that we can sustain for uh, the given race duration. And this model has been validated in a variety of different running populations. So a paper we published on young runners, uh, middle distance running in, in that middle paper, and then the top paper looking at uh, longer distance running performance. So with these physiological determinants in mind, it's worth taking a moment just to discuss how these potentially change with aging. 
So importantly, because of age-related reductions that we see in maximal heart rate, um, stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart per beat, and the amount of um, oxygen that's extracted from the blood at a muscle level, we see a decline in VO2 max as we become older. And this is illustrated quite nicely in the graph on the left hand side of the slide here, which shows um, the big black dots, the highest VO2 max is kind of on record, at least in, in the published literature. And the thick black line, which represents the 50th percentile of the whole population. So I guess that represents roughly the average of the whole population. And then the top and the bottom dotted lines, which represents the fifth and the 95th percentile, respectively, in the whole population. So because VO2 max is, is kind of our gold standard um, or most important predictor of endurance performance, at least in, in a large population, this gradual drop means that its relative contribution or importance to distance running performance actually increases as we get older. Conversely, and I guess perhaps surprisingly, we don't actually see very much change in running economy as, as we become older. And this might be due to the fact that uh, we lose a little bit of muscle mass as we become older. There's some subtle changes in running mechanics as we age, which might be attributed to the, the volume of running that we're acquiring. Or perhaps it's a long-term shift in muscle fiber type, so we get a higher percentage of slow twitch fibers as, as we become older. And then thirdly, because we see this decline in VO2 max and running economy staying about the same, we tend to see fractional utilization staying about the same or increasing very slightly. And it's been reported that the world record holder for the men's marathon in the 50 to 60 year old age group and the 60 to, to 65 year old age group are operating at about 90% of their VO2 max for the entire marathon distance, which is, which is pretty phenomenal. So the deterministic model of distance running performance does remain the same. We've still got these three factors um, at the bottom that are feeding into endurance exercise performance, but because of the decrease that we see in VO2 max, this is the main reason why we get this decline in endurance running performance potentially as we become older. Just looking a little bit more closely now at running economy because VO2 max and fractional utilization are predominantly limited by our cardiovascular system and metabolic factors. Whereas you can see on this slide, running economy is influenced by a multitude of different factors and systems within the body. And importantly for me as a strength and conditioning coach, there's a number of different biomechanical and neuromuscular factors um, which um, determine or, or feed into our running economy. So the biomechanical factors largely relate to kind of how we run in terms of the style and particularly the way in which we're producing force and modulating that force when our foot's in contact with the ground. And then neuromuscular factors which relate to the way in which we're recruiting various different muscles um, and the way in which those muscles are behaving during the running action and also the contribution that we're getting from the stretch shortening cycle so our reflexive mechanisms and the way our tendons are storing and returning elastic energy so the important thing for me as a strength and condition coach is to recognize that potentially i can influence in particular these neuromuscular factors which might lead to an improvement in running economy over a long period of time so this has kind of given rise to sort of slightly adjusted deterministic model of distance running performance whereby we've still got fractional utilization vo2 max and running economy which are aerobic capabilities that predict distance running performance but we can also recognize that these neuromuscular capabilities that underpin running economy and can be improved with strength and sprint training might also help our endurance running performance via improvements in running economy we also know that strength and sprint training might potentially be important for improving maximal sprint speed and anaerobic capacity, which is particularly, particularly important factors for middle distance running performance. So in one of the studies within my PhD, I actually set out to try and answer this question to look at whether strength training improves these physiological determinants of distance running performance. And I used a systematic review to do this. So on the right hand side of the slide, you can kind of see the detail um, and the, the process that I used for the systematic review. But we essentially just wanted to look at studies that use trained distance runners that have been engaged with the sport for at least six months. Studies that use randomized control trials. So that essentially means taking a group of runners and usually splitting them into two groups. So one group which acts as the control group that just continues their normal running 
and the other group that does their running in addition to some form of strength exercise, usually once, twice or three times a week. The strength training intervention had to last at least four weeks. And by strength training, we meant either heavy or moderate resistance training, which was usually with resistance machines or free weights explosive um, resistance training which is moving light to moderate loads as fast as we possibly can or plyometric training which is kind of jump hop skipping bounding type exercises and the studies needed to have measured at least one of the physiological determinants that i've described on previous slides so it's kind of surprising there's there's at least 50 studies um, at the moment that have tried to address this question but when we apply the inclusion and exclusion criteria um, 26 studies fed into the conclusions that, um, that we actually drew from this work. So you can see the results of the systematic review summarised in the table on this slide. I guess unsurprisingly we see improvements in running economy um, of the order of around about 4% on average as a result of engaging with a strength training programme for a period of between two and four months. We also see improvements in anaerobic qualities like maximal sprint speed and anaerobic capacity as I mentioned before, are particularly important for middle distance runners. And the other physiological variables don't seem to change much. So VO2 max, speed at VO2 max, and speed at various points on the blood lactate curve don't seem to be affected by strength training. Digging a little bit deeper into the findings of the systematic review, we found benefits across a variety of different subpopulations of runners. So both male and female runners seem to gain benefits. Um, the full spectrum of competitive levels, so recreational right the way through to elite runners, there's evidence that, uh, that it's effective. And importantly for this talk, there's benefits to both youth and also master uh, level runners. There seems to be a relationship between the magnitude of change that we see in running economy, so the improvement we see in running economy, and the duration of the strength training intervention, which suggests that it's important to keep engaging with strength training over a long period of time to keep uh, seeing improvements to running economy. And we also saw about the same level of improvement with different types of strength training. So heavy resistance training, explosive type resistance training and plyometric training all, to pe all appear to offer benefits. So we kind of speculated that perhaps a periodized approach is the best, um, the best way for runners to incorporate strength training into their work. So combining these types of training as part of a concurrent approach or a more kind of blocked and phased approach where you use different types of strength training for different periods of uh, short periods of time over a long uh, over a long period in order to keep um, achieving benefits to running economy just briefly digging a little bit deeper into the only study that we're aware of at the moment that specifically looked at master level distance uh, master age distance runners this particular study took 16 recreational master marathon runners aged between 40 and 50 years old. They split them into three groups. So one group which acted as the control group and they just continued their normal running. Another group that performed heavy resistance training. So four sets of between three and four repetitions. And then the third group who completed moderate um, intensity resistance training at three sets of 10 repetitions. And they performed this schedule twice a week for six weeks and you can see some of the exercises that they incorporated into those sessions. And the study didn't actually observe too much. There wasn't a, hu a huge amount of change in running economy, which you can see is measured here on the y-axis across the various different groups. The only change they did see was a 6% improvement in running economy at marathon race pace in the group that performed the heavy resistance training. So the authors concluded that there was a benefit to performing heavy resistance training in recreational uh, master marathon runners. So although strength training appears to benefit performance and certainly running economy in middle and long distance runners, a survey that we uh, conducted and had published in 2000 competitive runners showed that in the older age groups, which you can see circled here on this slide, there tends to be less engagement with resistance training compared to the younger age groups, and also substantially fewer than expected older runners participate in plyometric training, which, as I mentioned before, we know offers a potent stimulus to improve strength, uh, potentially running economy, and also bone mineral density, which might offset the risk of developing stress fractures. 
So engaging in strength training as an older adult, it's not just important for our focus on mainly performance related outcomes um, so far, but we also know that as a result of aging, we see decreases in muscle mass, which is known as sarcopenia. And this leads to decreases in levels of strength, uh, power, tendon stiffness, and just sort of general mobility and function as we become older. So there's a variety of reasons for this, but it's partly due to decreases in anabolic hormones, so testosterone in males and estrogen in females as we become older. And we also know that these reductions in strength and muscle mass can be offset with regular strength training, which obviously offers a potent stimulus to for trying to maintain these uh, different qualities um, and our function. And furthermore, in runners, there are several prospective studies Showing that certain types of overuse injuries are related to muscular weakness, particularly in the muscles that surround the site of the injury, um, and also muscles around the hips, so particularly the gluteal muscles. Looking a little bit more closely at injury in masters runners now, we know that masters runners typically get injured more often than, than younger runners, and this has been shown within a couple of studies. And the common injuries that we typically see in masters runners seem to be more muscle and tendon related compared to younger runners and particularly muscle and tendon injuries around the calf and Achilles. So there are obviously a number of different risk factors that are related to these injuries, not least previous injury, which is important to address, and obviously errors in training prescription. However, from an S&C perspective, um, improving strength and specific integrity of tissues is likely to reduce injury risk as well as um, loading to, uh, to the skeleton which drives changes in bone renal density and also enhancements in neuromuscular control so these would be the areas that I would try and address in order to reduce um, injury risk. So just to finish off the presentation and get into a little bit of applied, um, applied recommendations and some specific description around strength and conditioning particularly for runners that are new to strength and conditioning, the way that I would encourage people to program is that with sessions that they dedicate towards strength and conditioning, to try and use a concurrent type approach because it doesn't take very much overload in order to achieve an adaptation in the sort of short to medium term at least. So I generally set sessions up like this, whereby the first 15 to 20 minutes of the session are movement preparation, so working on mobility, neuromuscular control, uh, um, some st stability, potentially targeted activation, particularly around muscles and joints that have been injured in the past, and then move on to a section of the session, usually 10 to 15 minutes, that's plyometric training. So this might involve uh, running drills, it might involve some low level skipping and some bilateral jumping, and potentially some close to maximal speed type work. Then move on to some, uh, some resistance training. So this might include moderate to heavy resistance training, with both bilateral, so two-footed exercises and single leg exercises, plus some upper limb work, and then finish the session with some targeted, specific, and I guess kind of quite isolationist tissue conditioning, particularly for tissues that are either vulnerable to injury or have suffered injury in the past. So for marathon runners, that largely needs to target the calf and Achilles complex, but also the gluteals, hamstring and trunk um, as well. So I thought I'd finish and hopefully this comes through on the recording just with a few videos of the types of exercises that I'll use under these brackets. So firstly for plyometric training. So apologies, there's a, a younger runner involved in these videos. I didn't have any video footage of uh, a master's runner. But typically with these low level plyometrics, I would use five to six exercises. I wouldn't be too bothered about quantifying foot contacts because they're not too much heavier loading than sort of normal running. And I would try and aim to do them around about three times per week. So these are gradually more progressive in nature because they're going from bilateral to unilateral. And then more moderate intensity is dropping from height and moving on just onto one leg. When we move into moderate to high intensity work, I'd be looking to quantify the foot contacts. So starting off between, starting off with between 50 and 60 foot contacts per session. And this is really getting into high intensity work. And this is an Olympic level middle distance runner. And 
getting some work with some young athletes. I'm quite a big fan of changing the surface, particularly for work on neuromuscular control and stability on landing. That's an international level female distance runner and probably one of the highest intensity plyometrics bounding, which needs to be progressed towards over a long period of time. Sorry. Moving on to resistance training. So with resistance training, I would try and select between three or three to four of these exercises per session. For somebody that's new to resistance training, I'd try and encourage them to work between about eight to 12 repetitions to start off with. Um, absolutely nothing wrong with starting just with body weight initially to improve technical competence and skill on the exercises before then slowly adding load. So three to four sets per exercise but between eight to 12 repetitions for someone that's fairly new to this type of work with between two and three minutes recovery between each exercise. So between each set. This is moving on to more unilateral works, so but step ups, variations of split squats and lunges. And then finally, to finish off, some examples of specific conditioning. So particularly for the master athlete, calf and Achilles is, is a key area to hit. So single leg calf raise, aiming for two seconds up, two seconds down. I utilize quite a lot isometric positions around the calf. So seated in a standing position and on a leg press. And then the load of active plant walk. And then we're sort of back into plyometrics now, but ankle dominant plyometrics. And some examples for hamstring conditioning. So either continuous hamstring bridges or isometric or st static holds. Nordic hamstring curls, and that's the ass assisted version. The single leg prone hold, so it's just got one leg supporting in there. An arabesque. And then hip dominant running drills and plyometrics. So B skips, straight leg running. Some examples of trunk work, firstly building capacity with various leg raises and heel tapping exercises, different plank positions. And then more isometric positions, so suitcase carry and a pal off press. And beyond these more isometric and static hold positions, I would then use a category of exercises that are termed sort of attenuating force. So this med ball throw and catch exercise where the athlete's having to stiffen their torso a little bit more unpredictably to random perturbations. So in summary, it seems that adding strength training to the program of runners, including master runners, is likely to improve performance and anaerobic qualities which are important for middle distance athletes um, which translates to improvements in performance. Age-related reductions in um, muscle mass and mus muscular strength power and stiffness um, might be an important factor which predisposes uh, master runners to several different types of overuse injuries that's an important area to address and in order to um, address these two different areas I recommend strength trains performed two to three times a week for master runners, and that should include heavy resistance exercise, a portion of the session which is dedicated towards plyometrics, and certainly some specific conditioning for structures that are vulnerable to injury or have been injured in the past. Thank you very much. Richard Blagrove, uh, thank you. That, that was a sensational presentation. Uh, a lot of great content in there and I'm pleased you popped up the uh, the cover of your publication there, Strength and Conditioning for Endurance Running. Uh, really, if you're listening to the, uh, the symposium uh, and you don't yet have that book, please pick a copy of it up. I would be referencing that probably several times a month. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, publication. But, but Richard, uh, there was some terrific stuff in there. Uh, a few questions uh, just to stimulate a bit of conversation. Uh, so interesting sure. that, as you mentioned uh, from one of the surveys there, that the engagement uh, does drop off 
with masters athletes yet the irony being it's you know the demographic the age group that seemingly has the most health and performance benefit or health benefits to gain do you think the tide is turning and i mean that's certainly one of the reasons why we felt passionate about trying to pop on a put on a um an online symposium around you know the masters athlete because there's still a long way to go but you think the tide might be turning I think it could be, um, and I'm certainly getting more inquiries from runners that are over 40 years old um, that have either approached me because they've picked up injuries or they're trying to target a particular event and achieve a personal best, for example. And so, yeah, they're, they're approaching me because they want advice on on strength training. Um, I think sometimes, particularly with those those older age groups, so over 60s, over 70s, they perhaps haven't got access to the facilities and the equipment that they require to do strength training. So even if they're interested in engaging, they haven't got um, the means to do it effectively. Um, and there's perhaps some apprehension and anxiety of joining a gym and going and not really knowing um, the environment and, uh, and how to perform the exercises. So I think that feeds into it a little bit more perhaps than younger runners that are in their 20s and are sort of happy to, to buy a gym membership and train in that sort of environment. So, but I think you're right. I think the tide's turning a little bit. Um, I think people are becoming more aware of, of health generally and the performance benefits that you could get from strength training. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, your scientific contribution really uh, is a big part to play with informing clinicians uh, and colleagues around uh, the meta-analysis that you did there, the systematic review around uh, uh, the benefits of, uh, of strength training, uh, re-performance. Uh, essential reading depth definitely uh richard the concurrent approach the session design uh, i think that was, that was a brilliant slide if it's a, if there's a time poor uh athlete out there who looks at all that and is a little bit overwhelmed with each of those um, subcategories uh yeah do you have any advice to that uh to that time pressed athlete say they've only got 30 or 40 minutes uh and feel like they would be able to get all that done yeah, and no, that's, that's a really great question, Brad. Um, and I, I don't like to usually give out messages and recommendations, which are so sort of general in nature, like this is how to, how to plan a session and these are the best types of exercises because it's obviously very individual. Um, it depends on what the athlete's aiming for, the level they're competing at, um, their age, obviously, um, but also things like their current movement skill and previous strength training experience, past injuries, but loads of things feed into the decision-making process around how you plan a session and training week. Um, but to, yeah, and answer your question. So in, a, in one paper that I, I published in um, a professional strength and conditioning journal, we did offer several different kind of models for planning training. Um, so one was kind of, as I described in the presentation, where you've got two or three sessions a week and everything goes into those sessions with perhaps slightly more emphasis on some things in one session and, and less on, on, on others. Um, but an alternative model, particularly for those that have got less time and can't dedicate two or three whole sessions a week to strength and conditioning, is to start to split those training units, as I call them, so the movement preparation, plyometrics, resistance training, and specific conditioning um, across the training week. And so you end up doing some form of strength and conditioning every day but it's in very short time blocks. And so you might go for a run, so a 30, 40 minute run, and you might get back from the run and do your specific conditioning. Um, so that might be some Achilles loading, it might be some glute work, some hamstring work, and that only takes 15 minutes to do. Um, you might have another day where you do a little bit of resistance training when you get back. So if it's at home with bands, with kettlebells, with some dumbbells, hopefully with a barbell if you've got ac access to it, but that could be another another 20 minute unit. Um, and things like plyometric training can actually be done before some hard sessions because they don't take up a huge amount of time. They're not designed to be fatiguing, so they don't kind of fatigue your neuromuscular system. Um, and they might even potentiate the session. And um, there's, there's some evidence for that. And so if you squeeze a plyometric, a, a small amount of plyometrics into a warm-up routine, for example, it could be a more time efficient way to, uh, to schedule some strength and conditioning. Um, so that, that's another suggestion to be a little bit more um, time efficient with your, your management of strength and conditioning. Um, 
and I guess the other way you can do it that uh, that we've presented is change change where you put the sessions in the week. So do them straight after runs rather than as like a separate session. And that obviously has some limitations um, because you go into the session a little bit more fatigued, but it keeps everything as part of a single session rather than saying, right, I'm going to run in the morning and then I've got to find time later in the day to do a second training session, particularly for the recreational run. It's, that's usually not realistic, particularly if they've got family and jobs and a, a busy life. Um, they don't want to train like a full-time athlete. So it's a case of trying to combine it into, into the same session. Yeah, really great practical stuff there, Richard. And the reference you made to running drills, I think that's another great example of portability of some form of strength and conditioning, which, you know, running drills could be incorporated before uh, really any running session for the week. Exactly, exactly. And for for those um, runners that are fairly new to strength and conditioning, particularly plyometrics, they'll get a stimulus from doing running type drills. So various different A skips, B skips, uh, straight leg running, um, like just hopping on one leg and then switching to the other, le other leg. Um, things like that where you're on and off the ground faster than you would be during ground contact phase of just normal running. Um, probably offer enough stimulus to drive some changes to tendon stiffness and stretch shortening cycle reflexive type qualities quite quickly. And then over time, so we're talking sort of months, you can start to increase the intensity a little bit. Um, so increase the height, increase, uh, shorten the ground contact time even more, um, travel further with your single leg hops or, uh, or steps. Um, and that way, yeah, you can, you can keep progressing drills and plyometrics longer term. Uh, fantastic. With the concurrent design, uh, Richard, final question here. Uh, I imagine across a year or a season, there'd still be a need to periodize that as an athlete goes. Yeah, sure. And I, I guess sort of beyond the, the kind of three, four month mark, and I, I kind of alluded to this in the presentation, we, we don't really have the literature and the research. Um, like running economy doesn't keep improving in a linear fashion like you don't keep getting reductions in oxygen cost and, and energy expenditure um, so you need to therefore be thoughtful with the way that you're planning and programming longer term um, and so i generally change the emphasis a little bit i'd start off with quite a concurrent type design because you, as i say you don't need very much um, stimulus or dosage in order to drive an adaptation in the early days but as the athlete becomes more strength trained over six months and then and then years you probably need to be a little bit more thoughtful so the volume of plyometrics needs to increase the volume of resistance training needs to go up a little bit so therefore for each block of training of say four to six weeks um you should probably be a little bit more focused and so particularly with some of the elite athletes that i work with that have been doing strength training for six seven eight years they have more sort of defined blocks of, okay, we're going to put a big focus on heavy resistance training for the next few months. Um, there's still plyometric work going on, but it's kind of maintenance work in the background or it's skill work, which is designed to prepare them for the plyometric block that's going to come later. Um, and then further into the year, we say, okay, we're going to do a big block of plyometrics and the resistance training as a, again, is still going on, but it's just maintenance work in the background at kind of a fairly low, low volume. Um, and so that way, as you say, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a more sort of focused approach to uh, the way that you program and strength training rather than trying to do everything as part of the same training week. So the concept of blocks, that's, that's terrific. Richard, this has been a sensational session and uh, your program, the, which, of which you're the program director there at Loughborough University for Masters in Strength and Conditioning. Am I right in that that is a postgraduate program? Or undergraduate. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, yeah, postgraduate taught program um, in strength and conditioning. Yeah. And the length of that, I think I might sign up. <laughs> um, so, full time, it's just just one year, and the majority of our students, uh, yeah, do it do it in a single year, um, with some coaching placements around around the work. Um, and we do have some that do it part time, typically over two years, but the majority is is one year. Uh, fantastic. Richard, uh, it's your beautiful five-year-old's birthday today, your daughter. So uh, thank you for your uh, contribution to the Masters Athlete Symposium and, uh, and certainly all the best uh, uh, henceforth. Henceforth.
Thanks very much, Brad. I'm, I'm really, uh, really looking forward to hearing the other talks. You've got some really fantastic speakers uh, lined up, so I can't wait to hear what they've got to say. Thanks again, Richard. Thanks, Brad.